All right, today's podcast is with a good friend of mine, Seth Engel, and he's going to talk with us about leaving behind the Prosperity Church movement and uh, and his experience with that. Now, we're, we're actually going to focus and hover around teachings that were concerning to him, and we would like this podcast to be a loving podcast to people who are li- uh, listening. Uh, we don't want anyone to feel like we are personally trying to destroy them. Uh, we don't hate anyone in this movement. We love them. We we really seek the best for them. And we would like to welcome a discussion on, on why it is that the people are leaving this movement. Um, you know, are there biblical reasons? Uh, is it just because people get upset because they didn't like a personality? You know, what what is it that's causing people to leave this movement. And so, Seth, welcome. You're uh, going through Hurricane Ian, 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 Ian right now. You're in the middle of Florida, so you're not really going through a lot of windiness right now. But uh, how, how, how are the winds right now? Um, so, yeah, well, first of all, um, Greg, thank you so much for having me on. It's yeah. It's an honor to be with you, brother. Uh, so, yeah, the winds, it's currently a Category 5 uh in in uh lakeland florida right now uh with hurricane ian um i'm actually currently uh in a hotel right now uh because i had to evacuate from uh the school that i'm at right now southeastern university so um but yeah thank you so much for uh having me on yeah absolutely so um i would like to just sort of get a a sort of brief summary of uh, what is it that first caused you to think about leaving the prosperity church movement but maybe actually it'd be better to go back a step further what is the prosperity church movement and then so explaining what it is and then what started you down the path of questioning it and and moving away from it yeah, so basically the prosperity gospel and then what is also known as the word of faith movement is basically centered around the idea that if you come to Jesus, if you come to Christ, then he's going to give you the American dream. He's going to give you whatever you want. He's your genie in a bottle, so to speak. And you know, with the word of faith movement, it's basically built around the idea, the premise that we are ontologically equivalent to God in nature. Um, ontology is the study of being. Um, that, for those of you that don't know what that means, because that can be quite a big word for a lot of people. Uh, but yeah, so the Word of Faith movement is premised on the idea that we are little gods, essentially. And because of that, we can manifest things uh, into reality, into existence, and, you know, with our words and with our faith. And, and if we have enough faith, we can make it reality. So that's essentially what the Word of Faith movement is. Uh, then, like, the prosperity gospel, like I just mentioned, is if you come to Jesus, he's just going to give you your best life now. Um, and so, yeah, that's... What, yeah, you're probably looking at sorry to interrupt but <laughs> your phone's buzzing that's be if it if, our podcast is going to get interrupted a little bit here because people are constantly checking on Seth to make sure he's okay because he's right in the path of of the hurricane though he's in central Florida uh, for those who don't know we're former Floridians ourselves and uh, when you're in the middle of uh, Florida the winds die down by quite a bit before they hit you in the middle of the state so he's not going to be getting hit with category five winds but he's probably if if the path path goes right over him gonna see some maybe category two winds um he'll be perfectly safe where he is but people are gonna be to <coughs> me checking on him so don't be surprised if this podcast is full of buzzing and <laughs> interruptions people love him and want to check in on him uh, so what yes. what <laughs> what were you gonna say? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, um, I was just, I was just making, yeah. I was people, yeah. Like you said, people are just gonna making sure that I'm, I'm okay, and we can just maybe cut. We can just maybe edit some things uh, if, well, if, 
or it'll make the or... podcast interesting. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so this idea that people are are mini gods, um, how does that play out? What what do they do with that? Like, what would be an example of of something they would teach? Saying, since you're a mini god, what does that mean? And what do they get people to believe? What do they get people to think they can do because of that? Yeah. So, and a lot of times, yeah, when you said people come about mini gods, and uh, that. And that idea, and here's the thing, a lot of times those ideas, they really aren't going to necessarily say it verbatim, like you are a little God, like that's pretty obvious, but it's really what these ideas that some of what we're going to, the, the word of faith movement teaches is what that leads to in the end. And, so, and many teachers do say that. Right. There, there are definitely teachers that do say that, but not all of them. Good and, point. Yeah. Yeah. Not all of them do, but it's definitely, it's, whether it's by whether it's verbatim or by implication that's really what the teaching leads to um and when you just take these teachings to their logical conclusions that's what you end up teaching and you know based on that idea um they, people are taught that they can speak things into existence that they can manifest things into reality with their faith with Excuse me, with their words through things like declarations and decrees. Um, so very much like equating ourselves with God, almost, almost like, almost like Mormonism in some sense. Where yeah, it's, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, Mormonism, but really more so has to do with the New Age, um, the New Age um, idea. It, it's it also um, very it's parallel to something what is known as the law of attraction. Um, What's that now? If you've probably heard. So the law of attraction is uh, it's the idea that like attracts like. So um, there's actually a book called The Secret by Rhonda Byrne. I don't know. I don't know if you're have you ever heard of that? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. Yeah, it's, it was a very popular book that was teaching the idea of law of the law of attraction. Um, the law of attraction, the idea that if you whatever you speak out into the universe is what's going to come back at you. Okay, okay. And that's, that's really what it is for that. There's, um, and that there's an equal and that anything that you say there's or that you do, there's going to be like an equal and opposite reaction, almost like karma. And no, was that person who um, said that wrote that uh, an actual Christian or somebody who's more a new age author? Uh, uh, Rhonda Byrne. She, uh, she's like a new age. Oh, okay, and then this has worked its way into the yeah, it works its church. way into yeah, it works its way into the word of faith stuff, and then what you're just doing um, is you're slapping the um, you're slapping the label, uh, you're slapping the name of Jesus on it. That's really what word of faith teaching is essentially at its root is that it's new age teaching. Um, Versus, it's new age teaching uh, with the name mm. of Jesus left on it. That's what this is. And so the, the theological argument that gets tacked onto this and just add any enhancements to or corrections to anything I say on this, but the theological argument that seems to come into the prosperity church movement is man is created in the image of god well what can god do god can command and call things into being therefore because we're in the image of god we too can command and call things into being that would be their argument is that accurate yeah. missing anything uh, yeah, that exact that is that is exactly the that you're exactly right. That is what word of faith teaching essentially teaches is that be, um, because we are created in the image of God, we can do the things that He can do. Um, that on, that um, even though the Bible says that only He can do that, the word of faith movement teaches that we can also do those things. Um, you know like, you know, speaking things into existence, for example. Um, 
that's a that's a very that's a that's one of the core dot that's one of the doctrines of word of faith teaching. yeah so that's that sounds like a very persuasive argument um many times when you're studying theology you will hear an argument that if all you had was just that verse from Genesis one, and um, if all you had is that verse and that argument, it would seem perfectly reasonable. But in theology, there's always more than just the one verse. There's always things mm -hmm. that regulate our understanding. And, and we would say that scripture adds that there are distinctions between God and man. So just because we're in the image of God, and yes, we truly share some attributes like God, we're conscious, we're thinking, um, and, and so forth. You know, we, we can possess knowledge and reason through facts. There are limitations. God, for example, is uncreated and being in the image of God doesn't therefore make us uncreated being. So it's, it's probably a, a simple, a good way to say this would be a simplistic understanding of scripture without actually taking into account the fullness of what everything scripture has to say. So if I can just quickly kind of summarize what we've arrived at so far is so the prosperity church movement has origins or influences from new age teachers, probably 70s, 1970s and 80s influence. Yeah. And that's brought into the church, but then given a theological argument based yeah. off Genesis 1, that we are in the image of God. And then it, the question, they stop there and they go, well, what can God do? God can create, therefore we can create, we can make things right. come to pass. And, um, and it, so we've arrived at a theology that's simplistic, but doesn't take into account everything scripture has to say about the God man distinction. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. And yeah, about people being created in God's image. Yeah. And like you said, we possess certain attributes that are communicable, but then we, they're traits that only God possesses that are incommunicable. And when we're creating God's image, it means we're created in his likeness. Um, um, meaning we reflect, um, you know, like in terms of persons, uh, you know, like God is a person and in the sense that we're persons, um, you know, the, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Meaning he has, he has a mind, he has a will, he has emotions and we're created in his image. And so we also possess those kinds of characteristics that are communicable so yeah you know, we can know facts but unlike god we cannot know all facts and god as we reason from scripture not only knows all facts but he knows them all at the same time and he is aware of all facts as they have existed are existing and will be in existence and he's aware of all these facts all at the same time so like that that absolute massive infinite uh, abilities of god is something we do not have and so theologians will call this the creator uh creation distinction there's there is a distinction so we we contain some things like god to a limited portion uh, but we cannot as finite limited beings contain everything that's in God. So there's going to, there's going to be an expectation that God uh, not only cannot give us, he cannot make us uncreated beings. We're, you know, we're going to be created beings. Well, I, 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 people hate the word cannot, but you know, God, God will not make something <laughs> that, um, um, shares his attributes. God is going to be glorified. God alone is going to hold back things for himself. God alone is going to be God. He's going to be our father. We're never, because we're in the image of God, going to become God. We're never going to become the father uh, in heaven. I mean, there's just things that are reserved just for God. Um, 
So um, what, what caused you to sort of begin to question um, this with, and we're not, as we go down this path, we're not trying to um, pick necessarily personal fights uh, with people in your, your past, but just sort of like what, it, what it, the, the system of thought, that's what we're, we're getting at. Um, what is it that caused you to have doubts about this movement? Yeah, so um, I guess to backtrack a little bit, um, I was, uh, I was, I, my, I've been in this movement, uh, I was in this movement for a decade um, with my family and um, was raised in a loving um, Christian household, which I'm thankful for. Is it okay if I kind of go back for some context? Yeah. Yeah, so um, yeah, I was born and raised in a Christian household was actually born with cerebral palsy and um, was actually born three months premature on December 31st, 2000, uh, two pounds and nine ounces. Oh, wow. And yeah, I was, so I was basically a doll uh, when it, um, when I was born. And, uh, and so, and as a result of being born premature, there was a brain bleed, which was what resulted in the cerebral palsy. Uh, and for those of you that don't know what that is, it's a, it's a disability that affects people's motor skills. Uh, uh, and it's different for everyone that has it. And for me, it just makes my muscles tight. And, um, so that in and of itself has been a journey, but yeah, I was, um, but yeah, I was raised in the church my entire life and, um, um, it was, um, I was initially raised, um, uh, Mennonite turned non-denom and then we left the church and after some things happened that were not dealt with properly. Um, and I won't really get into that. Um, I mean, but it was very devastating. It, it, there was no abuse or anything like that. There was no abuse or, you know, scandal, just things not being run or handled properly and which happens sometimes unfortunately and unfortunately it was not dealt with properly by the leaders and and so our extended family a lot of our extended family as well as friends that went there it was like a small church uh we ended up leaving and kind of going our separate ways and that church actually ended up closing down a few years down the road due to low attendance and Mm. So that was, so we had left in 08 and then my family, we started searching for a church to go to. We were visiting some different churches and for about a year. And then by the spring of 09, we landed in a um, Pentecostal Assemblies of God church that we didn't know actually had word of faith prosperity Mm -hmm. gospel leanings and and i and i try to and i say that because i want to bring out those distinctions because um when we're talking about word of faith prosperity or even the new apostolic reformation the hyper charismatic movement um i distinguish we i i I distinguish that from the pentecostal charismatic assemblies of god yeah because not all pentecostals go there Right. Not all Pentecostals, Charismatic, AOG (laughs) go there. And in fact, they on their website, if you go to their papers, um, they rebuke some of those doctrines like positive confession, positive confession. You know what I confess, I possess or you have what you say. Uh, Dang it. I forget. I don't know why. Uh, I don't know the quotes. Uh, Uh, The person, the quotes, uh, the percent of the quotes, um, um, I could probably I could probably find that later in, um, but yeah, I know it's, I, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely by popular word of faith teachers. Um, but yeah, uh, we didn't know that, that, um, that this, the, while they were a Pentecostal assemblies of God church, we didn't know that they had word of faith, prosperity leanings. And, but we ended that's where we landed in 09. And then that's where I grew up for pretty much a decade. And then in 2016, 
that's when uh, it was in the summer of 2016. I went on a local mission trip thing that they were doing. I was 15 years old at the time. And long story short, during that, at one point during the missions trip, I experienced something that was very spiritually dark. Uh, I didn't see or hear anything, but I could just sense it, you know, because there are times where you can just sense something is spiritually dark or spiritually off or spiritually oppressing you. Mm. And that's what I had mm. sensed. And, and that really... Um, that really wrecked me. It really broke me. I was just crying. I was a mess as a result. And one of the leaders uh, at one point, they noticed that I was kind of going through something. And then they took me into one of the, took me into a room and sat me down at a table. And um, they were actually playing a song that we were using Um as a part of what we were doing, it, they actually played a Hillsong song mm -hmm. and that's a whole, and I think that would probably be a whole nother discussion <laughs> um, yeah. as far as, yeah. as far as the music. Um, uh -huh. But anyway, that was, that was before I knew any of what I know now. Um, but she played the whole song front to back at the start of it. I was just, I was still crying. I was still a wreck. And then, but it was as the song was going, I was going on, I just really felt this peace. And I genuinely and I genuinely believe that I really encountered Jesus, encountered his love, his care, his presence, not be not because of the song or anything like that, but just in that moment, that is when he really just decided to um just really give me a taste of his love and so, yeah, his, in, in the midst his of care for me. In the midst of being in one of these churches and things not being right, you had a come to Jesus moment. That that's really what's happening here. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, okay. well, actually, it wasn't. Um, I actually didn't get saved in that particular encounter. Oh, okay, um, okay. But but that did that experience that did plant a seed in me where I became really more aware of the reality of spiritual warfare. Um, because growing up, I, I knew that the Bible was true in some way in terms of like, you know, general revelation, you know, you know, the Bible talks about, you know, the mm -hmm. rain falls on the just and the unjust alike and uh, yeah, uh, having yeah. common, common grace. So I knew that in some way, some sense that the Bible was true. I never was, um, I was, I didn't ever despise my upbringing, um, but it was, but yeah, this moment, but this moment really kind of, you know, in one sense was a, like a wake up, a, a wake up call, mm -hmm. um, mm. excuse me. And then a month later, I was, we were doing, our youth group was doing a youth retreat um, at a camp that, uh, and it was actually my third year there at this retreat and it was after it was actually after one of the services uh one of the nights of the services i don't remember too much uh but i do remember i don't remember too much vividly <sighs> excuse me but i i don't know exactly what cause is exactly in the exact moment but uh but I just remember um, somehow, and obviously it was by God's providence, but I, I mm. just realized I, that it was at one night, I realized I wasn't truly living for Jesus. I wasn't truly living for God. I wasn't in a true relationship with him mm. because prior, because prior to that moment, I would have professed myself to be a Christian, um, you know, I would have professed myself to be a Christian, but Jesus wasn't really the center <laughs> of, of, of my life. He wasn't really the cent. He wasn't really, he wasn't the center. He was more so something in the background. And, but that, but it was in that moment. That's when I realized I needed to start a relationship with Jesus for real. I haven't truly been living for him. And, and in that moment, that's when God saved me. Mm -hmm. 
and that was six years ago in August. Hmm. So, so coming to salvation, what you're saying here is coming to a true and living relationship with, with Jesus was actually one of the major first steps in coming out of this movement. Um, and we're not saying that everybody <clears throat> who attends one of these churches is part of the movement or is unsaved. I mean, I think of Peter and Barnabas in, in the book of Galatians where they were swept up with false teachers now they weren't false teachers themselves but they they were true believers but they began to not live in accordance with the gospel and hang out with and separate themselves from the gentiles and hang out with false teachers and the apostle paul says i i called them out and i publicly rebuked them <clears throat> pardon me um so we're not saying that everybody who attends one of these churches is unsaved. Um, right. And so right. like you, you believe you have a Christian family uh, who happened right. to come across uh, a church with some of these false teachings in them, and then you get saved. And then yep. because of receiving the Holy spirit, which scripture teaches first Corinthians two, that we receive the Holy spirit that we may understand the things that God has freely given us. That's one of the functions of the Holy Spirit. So now you, as a believer, filled with the Holy Spirit, are, are having new understandings. Um, and, and I'd like to progress to, like, to, before we ha um, started recording the podcast here, there were, there were two things you and I were talking about that this movement fails in. And one is, and I have a written here, how we wrote it in our little notes here. Um, the, the first major issue that appears to be missing in, in movements like this is a failure to understand the sufficiency of scripture. And we'll explain what that means in just a second. Um, <clears throat> and then the second error is an elevated view of man, which we started out by talking about which is that, yes, we're created in the image of God, but not everything that makes the image of God is what we are. So God, part of the image of God is he's a <clears throat> creator. And so we make we might create with created things, but he creates from nothing. Um, yeah, exactly. He is uncreated without beginning, but we have a beginning. He has knowledge, we have knowledge, but God has unlimited knowledge. And so um, these movements say too much about the image of God in man. They don't take into account what all the rest of Scripture has to say about the limits of man, but the unlimited nature of, of God. And the only limits that God has are he is bound by his nature. So God will not, he cannot by nature do evil right he's, he can't he, lie he, he's he not a contradict himself yeah he can you know he so when we talk about what, what god cannot do that doesn't mean we're um saying god isn't infinite in all his abilities he but he is limited in bound by his nature of things he cannot do whereas we are capable of sin and that that's an interesting thing we're created in the image of god but capable of sinning it god cannot sin god cannot do that so um there so the two things again are f failure to understand the sufficiency of scripture and an elevated view of who man is and i'd actually like to kind of flip over to what we were going to look at here make sure i have my screen lined up here yeah Hang on a second. Yeah. For some reason, I my screen got out of whack here. But well, I'm going to go to um, 2 Timothy 3.16. And, and I want to go into what do we mean by the sufficiency of Scripture? So I'm going to first read this passage. And it says, All Scripture 
is breathed out by God, which is just, it's from God himself. He, he spoke it. Uh, it's his words. And even though you see the personality of human authors in scripture, even though you see the, the vocabulary of certain authors, God governed over all scripture so that it's actually his word. And it came to pass exactly as he intended, uh, though he used the instrumentality of man. All scripture belongs to God. And it is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And notice its purpose is it is to be taught so we are to receive knowledge and facts from it. it. It corrects us. And it's to train us in righteousness. So <clears throat> if we ever ask the question, what is it that God wants me to do with my life? You're asking an ethical question. You're asking a question about what is the righteous path for my life? And the Bible says that scripture is given to answer that question, what is it that God wants me to do with my life? It's for training in righteousness. And then notice the result of scripture in verse 17. It says that the man of God may be complete. And this is the, the wording that scripture uses when it means that a man lacks nothing that is needed, nothing that God requires. So scripture uh, gives us everything we are to believe. It's profitable for teaching. It gives us everything for our, what we do. It tra trains us in righteousness. And it's, it's teaching as such that we can be complete. We can have everything we need. And then Paul says, equipped for every good work. So the question would be, is there any good work that God requires of me that scripture does not contain? And the answer is no, it equips us for every good work. And is there any teaching that I need, that, that God requires of me, that is not contained in Scripture? No, it, the teachings of Scripture will make you complete. They will give you everything that God requires you to believe concerning our relationship with Him and our relationship with others. Um you know, th those things that are most necessary for our spiritual journey with God are found in Scripture. So, um, <clears throat> my, my point being is we, we find in these movements people who will say things like, God told me, or God gave me a dream, or God gave me a vision that I am now to teach to the rest of the church as if these teachings were were never existed before, as if this is the first time God ever gave them, as if we were not complete until this message came around. And, and the scripture says the opposite. Scripture has everything necessary. So John Owen has an interesting quote, and he says, if, if there is a prophecy a man claims to have i'm paraphrasing this i'm somebody who knows the quote off hand is going to i would say if if a private revelation um agrees with scripture it's needless it, we don't need it or if a it's necessary if, yeah. It dis, if yeah it's unnecessary if it disagrees with scripture it's false yeah so if somebody says god told me and then proceeds to share something that is already in scripture well, then it was unnecessary because it was already in Scripture. Right. And, yeah. and in that case... If it goes beyond Scripture or contradicts Scripture, it's automatically false. Right, exactly. Yeah, and yeah, and if it, if it agrees with Scripture, it's not really the person speaking, it's really Scripture speaking, if you think about it. Yeah, it's God, God himself speaking. Um. And here's a principle that would be be helpful for people who are listening to this and pondering God's will for their life. Um, <clears throat> if scripture is sufficient, now when we say scripture is sufficient, we don't mean sufficient in all areas of knowledge. It doesn't contain all scientific knowledge about the, the world that God created. This is the knowledge God requires of every person to be saved, 
and to walk in righteousness, things that we are to believe and things we are to do are all contained in scripture. Um, but here's a principle you can take with you. If, if that is true, then there, um, we are not required. So we are not required at all to believe or obey anything that is not contained in scripture. I mean, this is very freeing principle. We are not required right. to believe right. or obey anything not found in scripture. And so if someone is requiring of you something not in scripture, um, it's, it's putting people into bondage. Yeah. It's, it, that's a really great way to put it. It puts people into bondage. So, um, my challenge to anybody in a prosperity church movement or, or any the new apostolic uh, reformation, reformation or what I would call yeah. hyper charismatic churches. I don't like yeah, just saying uh, charismatic. Yeah. Hyper charismatic. What, what Seth, Seth and I mean uh, about by that is that it goes beyond scripture's teaching on spiritual gifts. God spiritually gifts. That's beyond question. He equips the church for ministry. Um, but then there are teachings that go beyond that. And, mm -hmm. and that's what we would call a hyper charismatic church. Cause the church is charismatic by nature, meaning it is gifted for ministry, but its teachings are found in scripture. Right. And, and yeah. all of it functions supernaturally. We're not anti-supernatural. Right. All the gifts function supernaturally and scripture mm -hmm. functions supernaturally because the Holy Spirit is the one who makes it a, this word of God effective. It's his word. And, uh, and he enlightens us to understand it. You can't rightly understand scripture except by the supernatural working of the Holy Spirit. So we're not... We're not being anti-supernatural up against some supernatural churches. We're saying these churches are actually walking anti-supernaturally, walking in false teachings. See, think about this. If, if you begin to teach something that doesn't come from the Spirit, then the Holy Spirit will not empower you to believe to, um, to walk in that way. It's, it's not from Him. So why would He bless something not from him it's necessarily going to be that a false teaching is anti-supernatural or not supernatural right, right. what, what, what are yeah. your thoughts yeah. as i'm ram i'm rambling here but yeah g give me your thoughts yeah that's yeah that's yeah absolutely you're you're yeah you're right we're not anti i'm not anti-charismatic i myself would be a um cessationist um, in the sense that I believe that the miracle gifts or the sign gifts, the apostolic gifts, as sometimes they're called, are not normative today. Things like speaking in tongues, um, interpretation of tongues, uh, things like the gift of healing, but then also things like prophecy, dreams, and visions. Um, the cessation is belief would be that those things are not normative today to the degree th that they were in the early church um but yeah that's that's yeah i just want to make that very clear you know mm -hmm. this is not about the uh charismatic movement in general we're simply talking about certain teachings that have become unfortunately normative within the charismatic movement mm -hmm. yeah and um so when when people have the gift, say a pastoral gift, God calls them supernaturally. God prompts them supernaturally. God does communicate that to them personally. That they are called to this. God makes it evident to others. Like Romans 12 says, if someone has a gift, have them exercising that gift. Well, that means those gifts will be evident to others. Um, and it, and a person who has the pastoral gift gift should be eager, which means they will have an eagerness. They will know that this is something they this is something they ought to do, um, and that is the working of the Holy Spirit, particularly in individual lives. Uh, and Scripture tells us to expect it. That's all very supernatural working. Uh, William Carey wants to go be a missionary in India years ago, um, and 
against all odds, he ended up in India. Uh, he, the missionary society or the churches, you know, uh, resisted him. Certain missionary societies resisted him. I don't know if they were called societies at that time. Um, and um, at one point, you know, um, the military was opposed <laughs> to his being that they tried to stop him, but he still ended up there. That was a supernatural working of God. And, uh, and God truly was speaking to him, telling him this is where he was to go. So we're not at all saying that God isn't moving. Um, but I, I would add one thing. If you look in scripture, when do miracles happen most? Miracles have happened the most miraculous, like outwardly, uh, visibly evident, like, you know, um, signs and wonders and thunder and lightning on the mountaintop. Yeah. Those happen during God's yeah. great salvific acts. And we see that during the Exodus. Um, and we see that when Jesus was was walking his way to the cross um, and we see it as the missions going out and we're not saying God won't still heal right? Uh, and, and do that, but it's more prominent in, in the times of God's great salvific acts. And so when someone acts like it's super prominent everywhere, um, what we find is as people pry into it, like a good friend of ours, Justin Peters has done, um, and chase yeah. around these faith healers and say, well, all right, guys, heal me. Faith healers. Because he's got cerebral palsy too. And he's like, all right, well, we'll heal yeah. me. And they have people who literally have blocked him and pushed him out of the line of people requesting healings uh, because they mm. can't do it. They, they, so, right. so we're not saying healings can't happen today and don't ever happen. We're just saying they're not as prominent. Um, <clears throat> as they've ever been. And we're not saying that, that God isn't supernatural in his workings. When a person is saved, it's a supernatural work. I mean, it, it, you can, sometimes the spirit moves in our church in a way where we just had people, like so many people are moved. And then Sunday after Sunday, it's just regular trench work that we're doing, the sheer drudgery of ministry. And then the spirit moves and, and something miraculous happens. It's not because... You know, I had a better sermon one week versus another. It's just the spirit is sovereign. He's like chooses when he's exactly. going to move. But um, what here, here's a distinction I didn't get into. I think one of the things that this movement does, too, is it thinks you can conjure the spirit at will as opposed mm -hmm. to yeah. the, the spirit choosing. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, yeah, it, it's yeah, it's very. Yeah. And really, because in this movement, God is viewed as is treated as a um like a force that you can kind of bend to your will and it's the same thing like with the spirit um god the spirit as opposed to the spirit as opposed to being a person is treated like as some kind of force or some kind of thing that gives you these kind of experiences and not that you know we're anti-experience or anything <laughs> like that yeah, yeah um but really they're they're there, the Holy Spirit is often viewed in this movement as uh, is often treated in this movement like a force that kind of gives <laughs> you these uh, gives yeah. you these goosebumps on your skin and all these feelings and the emotions and all you know I've signs and the I've, I've actually heard it's I've that. actually heard it said do you do you have goosebumps right now that's the Holy Spirit and and right and, you know and okay well could would the holy spirit cause that kind of response ever oh of course i'm sure that 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 the sure. spiritual can affect the physical response so but but they make that the totality of the experience or as if they can it, it's almost like you're a spiritual jedi you just learn how to channel the force um yeah and, and yeah and what yeah. we're proposing is that yes, the spirit works supernaturally. Yes, we can have physical responses to the supernatural. When Jesus healed people physically, that was a physical response um, uh, being created supernaturally. But uh, what, what I think is a big disconnect is that the spirit is in control of these things right. and chooses when and to whom to perform and these how. acts. Yeah. And the how. And so like Jonathan Edwards was once preaching a sermon and some people think that he was sort of a very 
stoic preacher, very plain in his speech. But <clears throat> there was a great awakening that happened, and he realized that his whole church was sh was shaken, just as he had heard was happening across America in the uh, early Great Awakenings. Um, and he began to realize, wow, this truly does happen today. <clears throat> but, <coughs> sorry, but it happens when God wills, as God so chooses to move. Right, right. And uh, I think right. of Billy Graham. Billy Graham would go and he would do all of these um, crusades and he had a certain preaching style and he had a certain music. And people would uh -huh. say, oh, it's because of his style that, that people were responding to him. So other people imitated Billy Graham <laughs> and 12 people would show up. But Billy Graham mm -hmm. would go out and thousands of people would show up. Well, what's the difference? The spirit was choosing to move through Billy Graham in an extraordinary way, but not others. I preferentially right. Billy Graham because I went to his school at Southern Seminary, so... Okay. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's really when, and when you, and something that you hit on is, um, and when it comes to like, when it comes to, cause yeah, the Holy spirit sometimes will cause, um, there will be sometimes maybe a physical response and, uh, something like, you know, like a goose bump on your skin or something like that. You experience something emotionally, but when you begin to pursue that, when that becomes, the goal like in and of itself that's where people start getting into trouble rather than rather because they'll do it in the name of the holy spirit they'll do it in the name of god but they're seeking something from him that's not him yeah and, and that's really I'm trying to yeah it's either not from him or like they're trying to control the spirit mm -hmm. and yeah they're I, I got a verse here First Corinthians 12. So this is the church is supernaturally gifted for ministry. Um, and <clears throat> notice the sovereignty that is the right of the spirit to rule is what we mean by sovereignty. The sovereignty of the Holy Spirit. Verse 11 here, first Corinthians 12. It says all these, that is all these gifts are empowered by one and the same spirit. So they're supernaturally empowered. That's why we say we are, we believe the church is charismatic, that is gifted for ministry. We don't use the word charismatic the way most charismatic churches use it, but we'll still use the term. All of these gifts are empowered by one and the same spirit. And notice this, who apportions to each one individually as he wills, as he desires. And we get to the very end of this, and, and he says that not everybody has these gifts. Not everybody is an apostle or a prophet or a teacher or speaks in tongues. And there's circles that say everyone should speak in tongues. But he says that they do not all. In fact, in the Greek, um, some people will say, well, these are just questions, you know, yeah. these aren't answers. But in the Greek, the, the question starts with the answer. It, it actually literally reads, no, are all apostles? No, are all are all prophets? And in Greek, the answer that the reader wants you to have is actually the very first word. It's the Greek word may. So we would say it in modern language, we would say not everyone has prophetic gift, do they? Not right, not everybody right speaks in tongues, do they? That's how we would say it in a modern way. In fact, the NASB actually translates it that way, um, the Greek that way, because that's that's what it's trying to communicate. So, um, right. So right. I, I wanted to kind of just push into our our, our next uh, thing here: this elevated view of man that though we are in the image of God we do not possess everything God has and God has a distinction and some of those distinctions he keeps. And, and so I kind of wanted to go through some, some verses. Um, one, one of the great ones is that God's the uncreated creator. He has no beginning himself, but we have a beginning and God um, alone. Um, let me just go to this. Why is God alone worthy 
And it says this, excuse me, about God, that it says, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory, honor, and power. Sorry. Why? For you created all things, and by your will, they existed and were created. And exactly. this, this idea is who is worthy? Who is worthy? No one else is worthy. Why? Because only God creates. Right. Yeah. God only creates in the way that he does. And like you mentioned before, uh, God creates from nothing, but we can't. Um, because yeah. we can create certain things. Um, like, for example, if I were to take um, like over there, I actually have um, Ritz crackers and a cheese in a can, and I could create a sandwich with those things, but it's not from nothing. It's yeah. from something that's already there. So, um, but yeah, there's, <coughs> yeah. So that's really the distinction is that God can only, is the only one who can create things from nothing. We can't because we're not God. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And let's let me hear. Let me bring up uh, Romans four seventeen. Yep. Uh, and <clears throat> it talks about um, God is the one. It says here who gives life, verse seventeen, to the dead, and calls into existence the things that do not exist. So God's always. One of the great distinctions of God is that he's a creator. One of the great dangers of the prosperity movement is is trying to say, oh, that's great. God has it. You also have this. And God's saying, no, no, no. This is what makes me unique. I'm the creator, Mm -hmm. and therefore I can rule over you. Now, if you can create, then what does that mean? You have the right to rule over all you, you create. But the Bible says you don't have those right. God alone created. And so therefore God alone has the lordship rights that that he does. Um, So it's very important that we don't get carried away into this mini God teaching that many of these movements get into. But we, we really keep in sight the creator creation distinction. Um, One of the things that that God does all throughout Isaiah. And I wish I had time to look up all these verses, but if you look in Isaiah, Isaiah is constantly saying to people who arrogate themselves against God, God is like, I alone do this. I alone create, I alone know what's in the future and make it come to pass. And then God, there's a challenge. I'm trying to think of the, 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 the verse where basically the challenge is, all right, you try it. And God's like, I'm waiting. You try to, to make something come to pass. And, and you can't. That's the implied, uh, re, um, you know, teaching of that challenge is you can't do it. Only I can do that. And that's why we see all these people who said Trump was going to win the election, uh, uh-huh. and they were wrong. They were they they cannot do that. This alone, God does. Um, unless somebody happened to be a, a prophet or apostle, you know. Uh, but prophets and apostles revealed scripture. Scripture is now sufficient. Therefore, there's no longer a need for prophets and apostles. Um, though I would right. have to, I have to add one exception, one exception that we know for sure <clears throat> is we know that there are two prophets that are to come in the end days. Um, so that obviously there, there are some prophets that are to come, but not to reveal more scripture. Um, right. but, but to re to, to preach the gospel. And it does seem that, you know, there will be a season and, and it, but what will that season be in the end days, right before the God's final act of salvation will be miraculous signs and, and wonders. So we, we do expect that, um, right before in the great battle against the antichrist that that will happen. Um, but again, miracles primarily arise in a time during God's great salvific saving acts. Um, so here, I'm going to get into another distinction. 
Let's go to Isaiah 55, 9. Yeah, um, it's okay if I read this one. <laughs> yeah, you go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Isaiah 55, verse 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than... <coughs> I coughed. I thought I muted my cough. I did not mute my cough. It, it, I think it's I, okay. I think I accidentally muted your your mic in the recording. You want to read that again? I'm so sorry. Okay. Can you can you hear me? <laughs> yes. <Okay>. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it's it's okay. Yeah. So uh, it says, um, yeah. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Yeah. And so there's this. this we have thoughts. But God's thoughts are higher. We have ways, but God's ways are higher. And so we have true knowledge. We we can truly know things. Like some people think, well, God's so unsearchable. Um, we can't, we therefore we can't know anything. And liberal scholars do this all the time. They'll say, Well, God, you, God's unsearchable. So why do we even pretend to know anything? That's not what the Bible means when it says he's unsearchable. He's not fully searchable. He's not fully knowable. Um, he, so he's, but he's knowable. We can know him, things about him in true fact. We can have possessed true knowledge of him. Or why would God be bothering to teach us and give us his, his word? It's just that he knows completely. He knows infinitely. That's a huge, huge difference. Um, you you brought this one, Lamentations three thirty seven. I'm gonna bring that one up. Yeah, yeah, it's the verse that says, um, "Uh oh, uh, sorry, battery. Uh, hold on. Uh, are we good? Okay, it says. I'm oh, sorry. I'm, uh, I'm Lamentations. Not... Ah, there. Sorry. Uh, Stop moving it. Yeah, it's okay. It says. Who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? Um, that verse right there really disproves the idea that uh, that we can speak things that we can speak things into existence. Um, so, yeah, people because that's the um, challenge. Yeah, is think, who who can, who's done it? It's just it's the Lord alone. Yep, exactly. God's like you know that's who else point. can do it? Anybody? Anyone? Nope, just me. <laughs> That's yeah, it's basically say. So, so one of the one of the great dangers again of the of the um um of the word of pros- of the word of faith movement. Yeah, word of faith movement, even prosperity movement, all these different uh, hyper charismatic movements is they are telling you that you have these attributes of God, and God saying, "No, this is what makes me God." I, I dare you to try it. Just dare you. And when you do, what are you pretending to do? You're pretending to be a God yourself. And God says, nope, no other gods before me. You are now my enemy. That's that's dangerous territory. Right, exactly. That that is dangerous territory. Yeah. So, yeah. um, Yeah, yeah, so Mm -hmm. essentially the the speak things that aren't as if they are in Romans 4.17. What these teachers do is that they're and they will they'll sometimes they'll quote the verse verbatim, um, or they might just give they might not just give the reference. For example, I've actually heard it being you know used as you know we're gonna speak things that aren't as if they are. <laughs> and, <laughs> like wait, that was spoken of God. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We're gonna. Yeah. We're gonna. And yeah. And I I've heard this before, and I realized. Hey, and I was just like, hey, that's talking about God. That's not talking about us. Yeah, and, and when you're attributing a, a verse that is talking about God and attribute that to us, that's blasphemy. Yeah, and, and you can't do that. When it, so, yes, we're in the image of God, but it is obvious that not all attributes of God <clears throat> communicate to us or become part of us. And just one of the most obvious ones is God alone is the uncreated creator. So God alone is the one without a beginning. And he's so therefore he's uncreated and he's the only one that creates. And so you've got to ask yourself, too, is there anything else that I don't share with God? Well, yeah, 
he has infinite knowledge, but you do, and you do not. You are, you are a finite being. Um, is there anything else? Yeah, he's the Lord over all, and he does what he wills, and you don't. Um, and, and the list goes on. And so we, we call these the incommunicable attributes of God. It, it means there are, the, there are things about God that distinctly make him God that no one else will ever possess. Uh, he alone saves. He alone chooses the day when we die and when we are made alive again. He alone appoints the gifts of the church. Um, he alone has become man and died for our sins. Um, so really, he alone is the ultimate one who governs his word. He is the one who, um, who decided every word that will go into scripture. Um, so this is, this is very important that we get this down, that we don't begin to take to ourselves attributes. Sorry, my kids keep coming to my door. So like, are you done yet? <laughs> um, we don't <laughs> claim attributes that God has for ourselves. And God will just say, that none is like me. No one is like me. Um, exactly. And I want to get to, here's one, one more here. Um, Isaiah 46, uh, remember oh, yeah. the former things of old, for I am God and there is and no God, other. There's no other. Yeah, there's no other. I am, I am God and go ahead. God and there's and there's none like me. Oh, and see, uh, there's there's that that you're not a mini God. <laughs> no one's yeah. like him. Not even like him. Not even right. you know, there's there's things about his image. Why do we share? In the image of God, I think one of the great reasons we share the image of God is that we would have a relationship with him and know him. But here's, here's another thing, too. Uh, verse 10, De he's the one that declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done. And he says, my counsel shall stand, not yours. And I will accomplish all my purposes. I mean, Isaiah is like the slaughterhouse of all false um, denominations. There are so many false yeah. denominations that if they try to see if they are compatible with Isaiah, Isaiah will quickly put them to death. My son, I'm borrowing that phrase from my, my son, Jacob. He goes, Isaiah is like the slaughterhouse of all these false denominations and false teachings. It just, it just butchers them and chops them into yeah. pieces and tosses them out the window. So, yeah, it, go ahead. Yeah, yeah exactly. It, it, it really, when it comes to these teachings in general, um, you know, you um, when it comes to these teachings that we're going to be talking about, um, they can be, they can, all it takes is really just, just knowing scripture, knowing it well, and that's all it takes to really debunk these kinds of teachings. So yeah. when they really come your way um, and you know scripture uh, very well, and when you know scripture and you know it well, when you come across this, you can be like, wait a second, but you know, the Bible says this in, you know, this chapter or this book or this verse. Um, so it really, when it comes to, you know, word of faith, prosperity, NAR teachings, all it's, all it takes to refute them is just knowing the bible because they will take yeah. <laughs> verses out of, out of context to make it mean something that the the that the text originally did not mean yeah. or it's an incomplete it's you know like it's an incomplete theology so if i just start with genesis 1 and say man is created in the image of god god creates therefore because we're in his image we can create um you might think well that that makes sense there's nothing contradictory in that statement well but the rest of the bible contradicts your conclusion it's mm -hmm. not yeah. you need to learn more and the more you learn the 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 better your conclusions become um so um let me let me just kind of give a little summary of of where we're at here we'll have to wrap up real soon here but um yeah. I want to say, first of all, we are not saying that because you, the viewer, um, 
because you may or may not be going to one of these churches, uh, but let's say you you are, you're in a prosperity church, you're, you're questioning whether you should be in it or not. We're not saying that you're not saved. Um, we right. don't know if you are, you, you, you might not be, uh, but that's, I've, I have questions about people in my congregation who they might not be saved. Um, so we're not, <laughs> we're not accusing you of not being a fellow brother. I mean, look at, look at Sethi, he gets saved. And then God opens his eyes and leads him out of this church. And he gets saved while he's still a member of this. We're, we're not saying yeah. that, that your family isn't a cr true Christian family, a true believing family, and just happens to be caught up in this. Think, Remember, Paul and Barnabas were caught up with the Judaizers. Not Paul and Barnabas, sorry. Peter and Barnabas were caught up with the Judaizers in the book of Galatians. They never ceased to be true believers, and Paul rebuked them. He snapped them too, but they were true believers who were hanging out with false teachers. Peter, an apostle, you know, had that moment. Um, so don't don't take this as an a, a saying, oh, we know that you too are a heretic and destined for hell. We we don't we don't right. know you, the viewer. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, exactly. And yeah, and yeah, exactly. Not every single person that is in this movement is unsaved. There was a time where, like you said, I was saved in this movement. And um, if I can share kind of um, how I came out of that, um, you can. Is well, that's the, fine? well, to be quick, because we're. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So I got saved six years ago. And then, and then three years ago, that is where God began to pull me out of those teachings through various means, um, through having conversations with friends that actually left that same church for those same reasons and, um, and not to make it about that church necessarily, but, um, but yeah, God was using those people. And then also people that I began to follow some of whom you've had on your podcast, uh, people like Justin Peters and, you know, using resources like the American gospel documentary, the specifically the first one, um, yeah, American gospel, yeah, that was Christ a very alone. good one. Yeah, that that was really those were some of the things that got that was really one of the things that God really used to pull me out of that. And what he also used was there's a podcast called Cultish um, from Apologia Studios. Um, they have the podcast Cultish, they did an episode called Defecting from Bethel. It's a three-part episode where they actually had um a woman that a, a, a girl that actually um, was a part of Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry from Bethel Church in Redding, California. Oh yeah, and God act, and and God actually used the American got that American Gospel documentary to open her eyes, me, to the truth of what the the reality that she was being taught, um, yeah. false doctrine, and yeah, and so so that podcast that um, that God. God really used that podcast to start me out of that teaching and it was eventually leading up to COVID that's where I had to kind of face that's where I had to face the music uh, both literally and spiritually um, pun intended <laughs> and so um, but yeah eventually uh, the Lord um, that's when when the thing hit the thing that shall not be named <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, the thing that shall not be named when that hit in March of 2020, that's when my eyes really had been fully opened or even just like leading up to that. That's when God really just began to bring me to the end of myself. And then for the first few months, the first six months of quarantine, I began to reach out for help. Um, I began to reach out for like online, like in Facebook groups um, and just seeking, just really... Um, yeah, really needing, just wanting just help for help and support and for prayer to really come out of that because I realized I needed to leave that kind of movement. I needed to leave that that teaching. And eventually, six months later, um, by God's grace, he um, he I was event I was able to start going to a more solid church. Uh, uh, and that's and by God's grace. And that's what God will do for anybody who the spirit will guide you. First, first John two, you know. Uh, regarding those who would wish to deceive you, you have an anointing, meaning the Holy Spirit, 
and, and you have no need that anyone should teach you, meaning not that you don't need anyone to teach you anything, meaning you have no need that anyone should teach you about whether or not you're around a false teacher is what it's saying. Um, and it, it teaches you to remain in him. The Holy Spirit will teach you that. When Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and my sheep know my voice, they will not follow after another, John 10. Um, that's just the nature of somebody who's saved is they they come to see these things as they truly are. I just wanted to um, quickly, again, um, show the American Gospel. So AmericanGospelFilm.com. Highly recommend watching that the documentary. Uh, we have handed that out for free in our church. In fact, that's a good reminder that I need to buy more of those for our church. But we have handed out um, probably hundreds of those DVDs to people. Yeah. Um, and it explains a very good presentation of the gospel. So even if you don't agree with its conclusions about the movement, for Pete's sake, watch what it has to say about what the gospel is. And, um, yeah. and, and that, so that, that is a really, um, really amazing, uh, documentary. So, um, yeah. so here, here we, so we're not saying that you aren't saved. The spirit of God will move you out of, of this. If, if you really hear God's voice, you'll be, God will make things clear to you. That's what God does. Everyone he saves, he sanctifies. You know, mm -hmm. if you <clears throat> if you have the spirit, you will bear fruit. And in John 15, any tree that bears fruit, he will prune and cause it to bear more fruit. He will sanctify you. That's a guarantee that accompanies salvation. Um, but also remember that scripture is sufficient. It is where you need to go to gain greater understanding. So um, right. seek scripture and then remember to that yes you are in the image of god but not everything that god is is what you are you are the right. created being and god is the creator and so never lose sight of the creator creation mm. distinction and so I I hate to say this, but I'm, we'll have to wrap up here. But maybe we can yeah. talk talk on another topic yeah. another time soon. But I'm gonna yeah. well, go go ahead. You got yeah. some closing words? Yeah, and to those of you that um, like yeah, and so there I, there by chance that I'm gonna be having some family and friends that are in this movement that are watching this. Um, please know that. I love you. I really care about you. I've been praying for you ever since God opened my eyes. And I'm just praying that um, that this video, that God would use this or whatever that may be to help you come out of these teachings um, if you're currently in them. Because we know for a fact that these kinds of teachings, they're not of God. They're not of the Holy Spirit because they don't align truly with what he revealed in his word and so yeah just i just wanted just just to let people know that i care about them and um specifically my family and my friends that are in this movement and yeah, we, they're we, being we love you guys teaching and we're not calling you we're not saying well we know for sure you're not saved or anything like that not not at right. all um so it, it's many times people get saved while still in these movements and then mm -hmm. god makes things clear um this life is a life of sanctification this is a is a life where we we have to hash things out and so we want to help you gently lovingly process these things so i'm going to close out with that as my final statement my name is pastor greg thornberg and this is a ministry of redemption bible church and you are listening to our podcast